Now it's live. All right, we're live and welcome everyone. We're talking with Lisa again today. If you haven't watched the first episode, she is a certified master gardener in the state of California. Did you say UC Davis is the the university yeah, that runs all that? Central. Yeah, like uh, the master gardeners in um, like Lo Los Angeles or something would be out of the Southern California district. We have Central northern california and and southern california so th okay. they have a lot like i said just la alone has a huge huge master gardener group I okay mean, i was fortunate enough in 2017 to good they do a conference every three years statewide conference and they had it in long beach right on the coast it was really nice Stayed in a big fancy hotel and had learning all week long, just session after session after session. It was totally cool. That sounds cool. I, I love learning. I but, wanted to, I wanted to, something I was thinking about your tomato that you're crossing. I think you'd be better served if you used an open pollinated uh, aroma that you want to cross it with. Because it goes back to, you know, what your Berkeley tie dye is. And it's genetics but that hybrid you don't know what the genetics are behind it so i don't know how long you're gonna have to keep trying before you stabilize something completely um were you looking for aroma type or are you just trying was that the first thing you grabbed well uh that's the that's the best uh, sauce tomato that i've found it's really meaty and it makes good sauce it's not all watery and runny and everything so I, yeah. I wanted to use that, and but I didn't realize that. I thought the Roma was an heirloom, like it's essentially open pollinated also. I thought I was crossing two uh, pretty well yeah. established yeah. open pollinated types. Well, if it says F1 on the package of the Romas, then it's a hybrid. All right. I, I do still have that package. I got to get in the fridge and see what I what I was originally dealing with. But I did select those things like I was telling you to get away from the uh, blossom end rot. And that's yeah. what I'm having. I'm having a problem with, you know, those really pretty ones in my pictures with the yellow stripes. Yeah, I'm losing more of those to blossom end rot than I'm able to keep so far this year. So that's that's a little discouraging. But that's that's a Roma thing like we were talking about the San Marzano's. And that's the only one I've really had that major problem with. I would. There's an, uh, uh, there's a variety by uh, Renee's Seed Company called um, Pompeii Roma, and that's mm -hmm. an open pollinated one, and those get pretty big and meaty. All right, you're you're trying to get me to restart my project after being three years in now. No, I, no, no. I respect it. <laughs> no, I would check to see though that packet that you used if it's it if it says it's a hybrid or a open pollinated. Well, I I ran those for a few years and they did come out true. They were nice little. They're probably about that big, size of a Roma, and that they came out true each year. So it's not well, like I was, I was dealing a, with an F two. It might have been an open pollinated if it. And unless it's just a hybrid of one type of aroma to another, then I don't know. Did the aroma seep consistent when you were just growing it as aroma? Yeah, it did. <laughs> it, it was consistently bad about that rot, that's for sure. But the, the <laughs> shape and the flavor and all, yeah, it was very consistent. Uh, but other than that, uh, really good. I, I, I really like to make sauce out of my tomatoes and it gets us through the uh, winter months and we still have some somewhat fresh yeah. tomato. So. That's, that's uh, always my goal too yeah so did yeah. you did you get the flavor of the berkeley tie-dye at all passed along or yeah i've eaten uh it, it really came out true in the f3s is that that flavor stayed there on the ones that i selected i the, the i didn't it just so happened that some of the pretty ones also like came through with the flavor and the uh, texture and everything that i was looking for i i picked some more this morning i'll show them off at the end of this thing or i, could, I guess i could do it right now since we're talking about them but uh I was really going for the the sauce aspect with that that Berkeley flavor because people out there, if you haven't had that pink Berkeley or the red Berkeley, a good uh, example of it, like yeah. you're not going to eat another tomato that tastes like that. I don't know what those genetics are, what those hippies were doing, but man, <laughs> I love that stuff. I, they they did a great job on that thing. And uh, well, Matt Gates at Boar's Head Farms, like that, I stole his idea actually. Like a lot of his stuff is pink Berkeley. Uh, 
crossed a cherry, different types of cherry tomatoes, and he's done it with beef steaks, but he hadn't done aroma. If he had done one, I wouldn't have to have done it myself. Yeah. So I just decided I'm going to do my own and steal his idea with the pink Berkeley because I love that flavor too. And those expressions, like they do sell at a farmer's market. It's like somebody walks up and sees a beautiful tomato, like those uh, orange and yellow striped ones and the pink mm -hmm. ones and purple and that, that really you, knobby uh, one. Did you get any problem with the plants, though? I know that was what I, I was trying to breed out of my, Ber what I would like to breed out of that Berkeley tie day. No, I haven't had any issue with that, with the, like, the just like kind of uh, crapping out like yeah. we were describing they just that, that's the best way to describe it they crap out on you but no that it didn't pass that on in this hybrid thankfully I uh, haven't had that issue the only issue that I've had this year was a little overwatering thing and that's more of my topography and I wasn't accounting for that when I was watering at the beginning of the season so uh, I melted a few of them but they're they're still doing good it was just like it melted the tops a little bit as overwatering a tomato is hard to do but I managed to do it yeah, well, Mother Nature's doing that for you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure is. This is trying to kill my pot too. Is that uh, they'll be all right? We're gonna. Uh, it's always like this. We have all of that rain, and then it's gonna be dry as dry as where you are for weeks. And I'll be praying for a fraction of the rain we've been having. So, well, you you want to get to talking about your garden? I appreciate your interest in mine. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I, I have a few questions for you first, to, to mm -hmm. kind of to lay some groundwork here. Do you have access to a truck? Not anymore. <laughs> Not it, yeah. That's well, it. I have that, friends that I could probably get to help me out. Good, good. Uh, that's part of this too. Is uh, your your network? It seems like you've got a really good network around you, and yeah. uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to use this with this. So what I what I I wish I could just come out there and do this for you. <laughs> because you were you were you you were clear about your physical abilities and your husband and uh, I, I want to know about your what's your son's physical abilities? You said that he's starting to get sore and have pain and everything too. Also, can you tell me a little well, bit about what he's able to do? He's got a he's got a bunch of messed up discs in his uh, lumbar region, and mm. I'm pretty sure his neck is pretty fucked up too. He's got severe scoliosis. His spine goes like a snake. Mm. Well, my mom and I both have degenerative, well, in 94, my neck started with, I have five out of seven degenerating discs. So what happens is the disc goes away and there's nothing between the bone and it pinches off the nerves. So that same thing happened in my lower back. It's been jacked up all day yesterday. I couldn't do anything. Zero. Mm. The pain was just off the charts. And I've been dealing with chronic pain for a long time. But he's got the basic same issues, but exacerbated because he was born with the severe scoliosis other than, you know, he doesn't. Then he did a trick that we do when we're younger, thinking we're invincible. And he was running from some guys and he jumped off a 20 foot drop and fucked up his L3, L4. And it's just the way I looked at it is he just made things the onset of his start earlier by doing that. So he's also got, uh, yeah, it's just affected his whole body. Yeah. It's, uh, it, well, that's going to complicate know, the, things. The nature of it with the degenerative, I mean, it's not going to regenerate. So hmm. that's where I'm at. And this is 20, what is it? 28 years now. This month was when it first started. Yeah. 28 years hmm. ago. And wow. he didn't show any signs of it when he was young, but you know, when we get to be running and ripping when we're teenagers, we do crazy shit. At least in my family. <laughs> yeah, same here. Same here. That's, I think that's just a rite of passage. If you're not if you're not a little crazy in your twenties, you're not living. Well, he did it in his teens, so did I, but <laughs> I did it all the well, way up, yeah. <laughs> up until <laughs> probably I was twenty five. Well, I did it more past that, but you know yeah yeah i started in my teens also and i didn't straighten out until about 30. i started to slow down and kind of uh, uh you know you get yourself in a little bit of trouble and bad situations you start th rethinking your choices you know <laughs> so, so okay well that's uh that's hard uh, that makes this harder is that he's he's in such rough physical shape i'm sorry to hear that 
uh, anybody is, is there anybody that would be willing to help you with like some physical labor since I can't like teleport out there and do it for you? Cause I, I would love to, I would just like to come out there and do what I have in mind. Cause I know it's going to work, but oh you, well, you we, need... we do what we can when we can, if we get the right medicine and that's the problem, you know, we've been, uh, like we've been trying to get some Royal gold for four months here in my County. I even have friends that own a nursery and they tried for the first two, three months and I finally got them connected, but Royal Gold's been really crappy about helping me out just, and I'm willing to buy it and I don't even have any money and they can't. Yeah. And I still don't have it. Hmm. That sucks. Well, I've, I've, my, my focus is for you all to make some soil. Uh, I, it's not that hard. Yeah. As yep. you know. And you have you have the research, you're like a, the network, you have the network in place already being who you are. And yeah. if you can get somebody to do so, because it is a little what I'm going to suggest is a little uh, labor intensive, but mm -hmm. it's it's only at the at the start. It's it's right. not like a normal compost bin. So I'll, I'll get into all of it. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, teach me about gophers. I don't we have groundhogs around here. I don't know if it's the same critter. But uh, tell me about sizes and just uh, give me a little rundown on like wh what it's like dealing with gophers so that I can kind of understand what you're dealing with there. Okay, better. gophers, they, they run on um, tunnel systems and any they'll eat the roots of any plants. They'll suck a whole plant down their hole. I've watched them do it. Or when I, I'll come out one day and I've been you know going out to check on a plant that I newly planted or something. And if I don't put it in a wire cage of some sort, I've gone out there and there's no sign left of that plant. No leaves, no roots, no nothing. The plant is just gone. <laughs> so they say they can only go down a foot, but I beg to differ because when I dug out one of my holes, it's on a slight slope. I couldn't get out to the garden last time to show you how far out it goes there. But I was digging that hole down, and I swear there was a hole three feet down of the gophers. They come in from the lot next door. So ideally, if I could put a barrier along my fence line, I could cut down on some of the traffic that comes into my yard from that side. But the other side of my yard, I'd have to do the same thing. And if I don't do that in the when we actually have moisture, I'm going to have to get a jackhammer out probably. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, tell me about their sizes. Like what, what's the smallest to maybe the largest size? of? Well, the babies are probably like any baby rodent, you know, little, like little, like just like an inch or so. Yeah. Little tiny things. But I've seen them as big as probably a bit as a good size rat, not the rat that's running around in Chris's yard, maybe, but <laughs> a good size wood rat, um, probably six. I've seen them six inches eight inches okay. six is okay. usually about the biggest i've seen but they have usually a main run and then they have side tunnels off the sides so if you're going to try to poison them which i won't do because i worry about if i poison it with all of the rodent poisons are anticoagulants so that means their blood can't um clot you probably know that but mm -hmm. so they they end up dying but um i'm worried that a a uh, raptor or something will pick it up or as a nature with i had my cat it got a hold of a rat that it had some rat poison and he died of having rat poison which was a horrible death so yeah, yeah the gophers there's nothing you can stop them i've had plants like if that yarrow i was telling you about it's a native plant it'll it's supposed to be gopher resistant but when it's a drought if i water something really good that's not in a cage outside a bed or something I'll come out and it's gone because they're drawn to the water. They smell the water. So they know you're watering something. So they go right for the roots of the stuff that you're watering. If they can get to them. It's really just, there's not much you can do other than exclusion with them. That's why we have to do the wire when we make a bed. So I'm guessing you couldn't kill them. Like I do with rats with uh, baking soda and cornmeal. I don't know if no. they, they have the same day. So they fart and burp. I don't that's, think they would digest the same as as a rat. No. Okay. Yeah, and and they go after roots. Would they be going after worms if you had a worm bin going? Or they I don't think so. That would be more of a mole or something like that. But I don't have too. I don't have any mole problems. Okay. Anymore. 
they rarely make a problem. They're usually just going for grubs. So no, they wouldn't go for the yeah. worms. Okay, good to know. That's a that's one plus with these things. I, I, yeah, I see why you're using hardware cloth now because of the size range of these guys. Uh, I was expecting a larger Worm animal. Out, I mean, we have groundhog. Do they eat plant Sorry? roots? <laughs> They uh, hogs eat everything. Apparently, like they would go after worms and plants. As they're omnivores like us, apparently. So, and but they're a little they... dangerous. I had to catch. Up. We had one that set up shop under our shed, and he was scary to move. <laughs> <laughs> like this thing was probably like eight feet long. <laughs> <sighs> oh yeah, yeah. So. I, so I see why you're using the hardware cloth, but, uh, but I was what I had in mind was something that was a little bit more long lasting because hardware cloth is still a relatively thin metal. Even it's it's got a lot of galvanization on it. No doubt, there's a lot of zinc on there. No doubt, it's but it still rot the way as you know. You can only get so 15, many years. Fifteen good years, maybe. Yeah, yeah, about oh, fifteen good that's years. Not, that's that's better than out. I thought. It's the chicken wire okay, that's only so. like five years. I'm still digging up rusty chicken wire in my yard. <laughs> oh, that's and that's horrible too. I, I made a mistake too. Yeah, big problem. That's how we tried to uh, protect the shed from the uh, groundhog getting back in. Is I just buried a bunch, like three feet of that, out all the way around this big, big shed that we got. But like it, it it's more more trouble than it's worth and it's really horrible to remove in little bitty pieces you know what i'm yeah. talking about and maybe yes, some other do. people out there too it's no good what i uh what i had in mind and i don't think that it would work unless you like doubled it up but uh, it, it, you know that uh gardening fence the the uh stuff that's got the uh, plastic coating around around it it's like yeah. green usually the green yeah uh, i know what you're talking usually about usually relatively short Okay, so yeah. I, I was going to suggest something like that with what I have in mind here. Uh, and maybe like that may work like in your uh, to protect you from the field next door. You said the lot next door is where they're all coming from. So I think uh, a good portion of them are. Yeah, they yeah, run through my yard but, but, all the way down to the creek. And they're on the other side of the creek, too. Yeah, they're everywhere. They'll, they'll tunnel under asphalt. <laughs> I've got oh, man. Push up that, so. yes. Wow. And as okay. the drought well. gets worse, they show themselves. They don't show themselves, but they you see more evidence of them and the drier it gets because they're panicking, I guess. I don't know how how wet it is down that deep at this moment now. It's been a drought for so long, it seems like. We had some good rain for a little while there, and I thought we were going to maybe have a end up with a good rainy season, but no, we didn't. And then it's so blazing hot. It's 103 in the shade right now, and it's only noon. Ugh. It was it was nine it was 89 at nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> hmm. uh... Same with the the same with the deer or anything when you're watering. Like my husband says, you can smell the water in our yard. And if you walk from a dry area, like coming down from the, the road or something into the drive down the driveway, you can start to smell the moisture in the air from the garden. Hmm. And the deer, they hang out on the outside of the fence sometimes. But it's an eight foot chain link and I've never had a problem with them jumping that. Plus... Where they'd have to land is on a hill, so I don't think they're real keen on that idea. I saw one standing on a rock the other day contemplating jumping over, but I don't think it's going to try it. Uh, do you think that uh, caster plants would keep them away, like moles? Do you think that caster might keep a groundhog away? Like a plant that they don't like, like that they uh, like reach a barrier, like instead of like uh, burying a bunch of fence and jackhammering up your your land right. if it's dry like maybe plant some castor because that's a pretty uh hardy plant but i don't know if it would affect groundhogs like it does moles but they they stay way away from that stuff i have a buddy that has that stuff all around his house to keep the moles away from his foundation so well i think i, I would have heard about that by now but i'll have to have, look into that i mean it's worth a shot yeah There's ask a around plant. it's a it's in the euphorbia family and it's called gopher purge and it's a real pretty plant don't get me wrong but i bought it when 
early on up here when I moved up here. It said it was supposed to deter gophers. Well, I walk out on my porch one morning and I look to the right and I see it, the whole plant getting sucked down the gopher hole. <laughs> <laughs> A gopher purged my ass, right? <laughs> yeah. So I went back to the nursery and I was right. doing that and they're going, shh, don't say that so loud. I'm like, well, it doesn't do oh, it. Ah, you see. That would be my last trip to that nursery for sure. I was, that, that would go right through me. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I'm a firm believer in freedom of speech. Nobody shuts me up. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, one more question before I start getting into what I have in mind. Uh, your access to organic material. That's why I was asking about a truck. Do you have, have access to a nice... Okay. I got you, you, you have, lots of organic okay. material just available on my oak leaves and you know when we we have to weed eat, weed whack the weeds at the beginning of the year we've been leaving them on the ground let them decompose but um that's a long slow process i put wood chips in the past that are really pounded down about i don't know three four four years ago now probably and they're starting to decompose. Well, a scholar will make up a batch of tea, and sometimes it spills on the wood chips, and he gets that mycelium growing on the bottom of the wood chips. We're trying to get that network to go from bed to bed and and just keep that mycelium network growing and stay connected. But um, that's still a work in progress. It's, it's sort of limited on how much medicine we have, and life's been throwing a lot of curveballs at us for a, quite a while now. So we've been struggling. <laughs> struggling, struggling is the story of my life. So we do what we can. But when the heat hits, it's this, the ozone I was telling you about, it's really, really high every day. You feel it. I get out there and I've come to the point where I'm almost numb to, numb to it. I could get easily heat stroke really quick if I don't pay attention. No, oh, pay attention. Can't have that. Yeah. I just like, no, nope, I'm <laughs> not right, staying so... out here. I'm not, I can't wear a hat. <laughs> it's too hot. <laughs> can't wear sleeves. I'm going to have to wear sleeves. sleeves. But yeah. I have a gardener's tan. <laughs> Lots yeah, of organic I, I matter Mine is a... Yeah. Good. Endless, endless Good. places uh, I can get organic matter. Awesome. Uh, and how does comfrey do in your area? Do, is, are people successful growing comfrey where you're at? I was I was up until the last couple of years the gophers finally found it. No. I saved one little <laughs> I, I saved one little tiny plant that they didn't quite I had one plant left. I had like four or five for thirty years. Thirty years. Growing in the same spot, they'd come back every year. They didn't spread real far out on being the nature of the dirt and they're closer to the creek and they were kind of in the shade and I think they liked it because it's so blazing hot. But for some reason, like I said, the gophers just got to them this year and I, I happened to catch it and catch that one little piece that's left and it's still staying alive, but I'd like to keep growing it. Like I'd like it to spread like I've seen it spread, like I've seen pictures of it too. But I had a friend that had a whole yard. I remember going over to visit him one day, and he's driving his tractor, running all over all this comfrey that's taller than him. And his tractor's <laughs> sliding on the comfrey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine. <laughs> yeah. That'd be so pretty instead, slick. he planted raspberries, and I said, You think that wasn't going to do the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I've got about a quarter acre uh, comfrey patch out there. I grow the seeded variety. I know most people do the balking selections that he did, but I. Uh, I like that seeded stuff, and that's my goal is to have the entire front yard comfrey with an, an orchard and all of that out there. But that would be awesome. You know, comfrey if you if you make a tea with the leaves, it's really good for tomato plants. Hmm. There's a lot of my um, minerals and stuff in it that that it gives the tomato plants a boost. 
Yeah, it gives a compost bin a boost too. By the, by the, it breaking down so fast and it's yeah. like it's, it, it becomes a black mushy mess real really quick. Right. So, uh, yeah, let's let's get you a little bit more successful with the country comfrey and keep the uh, gophers out of it for sure because that's a, that's a big part of what I'm suggesting here because I'm really trying to what I have in mind is a, a supercharged compost bin that isn't labor intensive for you, except like, except for, like I said at the beginning, I don't know how long you've been watching this channel, but I've showed off my uh, worm bin in the past. I kind of stole this idea from Clackamas Coot. I don't know if you know who he is or uh -uh. Your, your son does. He's, he's a, uh, a pillar of the cannabis community. He's been around a very long time and he ran a nursery up in Oregon for uh, years. Like he's, he's retired from it now, but he, he developed this uh, way of he's, he's a worm guy. And so am I. So uh, I have a lot of belief in what the worms are able to do. So I'm going to, yeah, uh, I have some worms in, I have a worm bin in a tub, but I could easily move those worms. Just a handful out of that tub is going to give me a lot of worms. So I have good, the worms good, to good. start with so, to do what you're, what it is. Red wigglers, correct? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, I have to ask that because there's people out there now using the wrong thing. So uh, I'll go out and buy night heard colors, me ranting yeah. on that before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's uh, address this before I move on is there's a, a comment over here and I'm going to highlight it because you've already mentioned this, but I'm going to okay. see what we can do here. So this should be popping up momentarily. Jack Beanstalk says it. maybe Chris and his sponsor Royal Go can happen. We would we would really appreciate that, but uh, Lisa was saying earlier she's in contact with them and they're not making it happen. So uh, if we can get more people on them, is let's let's do this. I, I I would prefer her to build her own soil, but you yeah. know that's not I've been always... working on that, but you know it's in the beds I did for yeah. years, but you know it's that back to that now I have to try to the no till thing. So it's going to take a process of working over time to build up that organic material on the beds is working, but I have to start working on the other parts of the yard too, just to get that whole community thriving better. Okay. So I'm going to share this little thing down here. Yeah. Wait. Yes. Everything's going so slow. So in, in this picture, I'll highlight it, make it bigger for you. I can see it. This, okay. This is my uh, my worm bin, and what what gave me the idea was your uh, you have those rock beds already built, like a lot of your landscape. It's beautiful, by the way. Like I, I really like what your husband did with that. It's it, yeah. it, he moved a lot of rocks around. You can tell, and he uh, yeah. so did I with this thing. But yeah. uh, essentially, you have a lot of this already in place. So if you just like you see this pile in the back, the pile of the smaller rubble. Yeah, that's that's really the key to this. Like, do you have a uh, rubble like that laying around where you can take one of those beds and like make a uh, kind of a pile in the back of it like that? Probably. I mean, okay. I have broken clipped terracotta pots and broken this and broken that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got a lot of that. I, uh, Lisa, I even have asphalt in there. I know a lot of people wouldn't know. There's little as asphalt chunks in that too. And a lot of people yeah. uh, get upset about the petroleum. It's, uh, to me, that's just carbon. Like the worm, it hasn't hurt my worms. My worm, the reason that this, this works is we have a really cold winter here. You said that it gets cold and you have snow yeah. and all of that because of your location. So that's why this, the, these rocks in the bottom of this pile, this thing is, I, I emptied this out to do my uh, second garden this year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the, this thing was completely full, like all the way out to the edge. And, uh, and it was just one year that this thing broke down and created like, uh, I don't even know how many cubic feet of uh, beautiful, rich compost. There was so a- were you, uh, What were you adding to the worms besides uh, the rubber? That's why I was asking you about your uh, organic material availability is uh, leaves, uh, chicken coop waste. Uh, I did start it off with my, uh, my neighbor gave me several buckets. There's probably like 10 buckets of uh, cow shit. So yeah. I had, uh, cow manure in there you don't but you don't have to do it exactly like this but no, it's essentially 
Yeah. And the comfrey, the comfrey is a main thing. Like I, okay. I really let my comfrey grow up, like not quite as tall as what you said your friend had. I, yeah. I can't believe comfrey was able to stand up that tall on its own because of all the weight in it. That's yeah. kind of amazing. That, that's some really, uh, really strong surface tension within, within the vascular system on that plant to be standing yeah. that tall. So that's, that was impressive, but essentially it's just uh, yard waste, like leaves and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comfrey is, that's really the supercharger. And I, yeah, it is. there's no mixing with this. It's just yeah. layering. It's, it's you just layering it up and the worms do all of the mixing. It's really right. beautiful how it works. It's like, it, it was fun. It was a lot of fun uh, taking this thing apart this year after just one year. And I, I could remember like each layer pretty much that I was laying down and you mm -hmm. could just barely see the layers still there and just places where the the worms weren't traveling and moving things up and down. And right. uh, so if you can utilize one of your like uh, sacrifice one of your your beautiful beds and kind of clear it out and put this uh get that rock set up in the back because that's where the worms live during the cold uh cold months is they oh. dive into that that bottom area there where it's nice and warm mm -hmm. and all of this rock trapping the sun throughout the day and then slowly cooling down throughout the night this this really works and that's we have a lot idea. worse we have a lot worse winters than you do i'm sure yeah so that, it, that makes sense so if you can slowly get something, like I said, clear out one of those nice areas that you got and sacrifice a bed and turn it into one of these, and then maybe like do, do another one. That's uh, more like, I, I, I don't want to sacrifice all of your beautiful beds. I know you want plants in those instead, <laughs> of, uh, but if you could do like, do one of these and then, uh, if you do a normal composting system is like, maybe you can do like a, just a, another uh one of those beds and just like have the compost in one half of it and then just every once in a while like kind of uh, pitchfork it over and have worms in there also obviously to help help right. things speed up but if it's just if it's really small and it's just a few pitchfork tosses for you to toss it from one side to the other just to get it flipping and turning and uh moving a little faster for you yeah. it's gonna it's gonna really be more beneficial than just the top chop and drop and it's right. not going to be a whole lot of work. What I'm trying to do here is to make this happen without uh, putting a bunch of uh, labor on you guys. Like right. this is, that's the whole point of this. And that's why Coot developed this. Uh, he, uh, he actually, I, I kind of supercharged what he was doing. He was using one of those big fabric pots and he would pile the center of it up with volcanic rock. And then mm -hmm. he would, he would build a, uh, vermicompost out of that just let the worms pile in all of the uh necessary organic material and just as as time goes on throw kitchen waste and all of that stuff it's it's a worm bin you know how to do a worm bin right. so this is just a large scale and one that can go all year round that's the key to this is those yeah. rocks make this a, a year-round process so something that would take like two or three years to break yeah. down is going to get done in one year and you're going to have a whole lot of material to work with i, well, I guarantee it that's a great idea yeah i can do that i got enough pieces of this and that and the other thing to make a bed like that okay good but it seems like your major problem is like keeping gophers out of everything like uh, yeah I they get under my compost pile too okay yeah so i could always put wire under it and just piss them off <laughs> <laughs> yeah i yeah. like to piss them off <laughs> I've I, I, I've done is I'll I'll have an old trout in the freezer from fishing or something, and when I find a gopher hole that I can get half my arm in, I will take that frozen go uh, trout and stuff it back as far as I can get it in that hole, and then cover the hole back up. And while that fish is decomposing, it the gopher leaves that area alone. I don't know why it works, but then I started thinking. I don't know if you remember in grade school, they'd show you a picture of an Indian planting a piece of corn with a fish in the hole. I start to think mm -hmm. maybe the Native Americans somehow knew that that kept gophers away from their food. <laughs> <laughs> Plus it fertilized it at the same time. But, you know, that was my, my whole hey. thinking on that one. But I've done that That's plenty it. of times and it'll, they'll keep. As long as that fish is still decomposing, they'll stay out of the area. But once it's gone, they're right back there again every time. Huh. Yeah. That's, 
kind of like Japanese beetles. I, I've heard that you all don't deal with uh, June bugs out there, but uh, Japanese beetles is the really the aside from seven. The best thing that I've learned, I learned this from an old farmer, is he told me to go around and like squish them on the plant. Like when you see them, they're they're very slow and stupid, and they're big and and crunchy. So it, it's it's really easy to like pinch them and crush their exoskeleton and get their juices all over that plant. Yeah, oh, I think all off the plant into the bucket, too. Yeah, but he was saying that it, when you uh, it they release something is it, well. But they release That's death terrifying. because they're getting squ squished and yeah. other June bugs won't come around that plant because it smells like dead June bug and they want nothing to do with it. Kind of like us. It's like we don't want to be around dead bodies either. And it sounds <laughs> like neither do gophers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so your, your, your husband and son can, or yourself, it, it, you all can do a little bit more fishing, it sounds like, and just like yeah. bury your guts. You know, bury you can eat the, the fish and bury the guts. Yeah. Well, we end up <laughs> with... They stock a lot of fish in the streams and the lakes out here when there's water. But for some reason, a lot of times this it's, the fish have been getting parasites. And so instead of eating them, we just keep them for <laughs> go for bait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's kind of like catfish around here. Unless I know the farm that it's on, I ain't. I ain't that <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll catch them all day, but I ain't eating it. Exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I, I'm glad that you're digging the uh, the worm bin idea. I, I call that stuff coot post. It's because it's the Clackamas coot was really on to something with that. And I'm glad that I took a gamble and went into all of that. It, it was a lot of labor setting that up. And uh, half right. of yours has already been done. Like you just have to move small rocks now. Your husband yeah. has done a lot with all of that rock moving and yeah. and the worms are gonna love what you have. Like all of that granite, like you have like so much mineral wealth gardening right. wise with all of that. And the worms can convert that into usable material for you. Right. So it's I, I'm glad you're you're into that. And we need to find a way for you to I guess when you uh spread your comfrey around, uh spread a bunch of fish around with them too <laughs> i don't know but that's that's really the key to this is that comfrey really supercharges things yeah. it's a lot better than leaves and grass that's i'll for have sure. to get a hold of some more and 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 get it started going in the ground again yeah i just can't believe after so many years that they finally attacked it but they started <laughs> eating my irises too so last year I had to dig all that was left up before they ate them. So that means in order for me to plant an iris bed, I have to line a whole bed with wire, and I'm not looking forward to digging out the dirt to do it. Yeah. So I have yeah. all my irises in buckets waiting to be planted. And I'm like, <laughs> and I don't know, if you know how irises are, they're always multiplying. So I don't yep. know, that's why people are giving away bags of them, I guess. <laughs> yeah it's the, oh, they're crowding each other out that's uh and you know that uh, that hardware cloth ain't cheap it, nope. it gets expensive buying all of that and then you're, you're just burying it and it's labor intensive and it isn't cheap so that's why i was i was trying to get you a few more years out of the fence but the gophers being that small i wasn't expecting them to be such a small critter that that no, makes them harder like to when, when you use like chicken wire if you don't double it and offset the holes They'll go through those holes. Yeah, that, and that's twice the expense. And so I think you found the best uh, solution for your but hardware cloth. Like, again, that's a it's lot of metal. That and or, or like I said, a raised bed. Or if we use a, we're going to try some of the living. So we've got a few of the living soil beds that we want to fill, which was, was another reason why we were trying to get a hold of some more royal gold to just start help in it we're not going to just put straight royal gold in there we're going to use sediment from the backyard we have an area where the creek runs down in the winter time and it brings down all the sediment down the hill and it's got a lot of nice sediment in this area that we've been digging up and mixing in with anything that we put in the pots now especially the cannabis seems to really take to it so that's the idea of that but that and then we have to go dig it up so <laughs> <laughs> but we do it <clears throat> it's just it takes longer sometimes and like yeah. i said 
since we have to buy our medicine right now, I mean, we, we're, we don't have any plants that are, we have one that's about ready indoors, but we didn't get any out like we wanted to because we were waiting for dirt. We were thinking we could get it in less than four months, but you know, hey. <laughs> you would think. So, yeah, and you were, it wasn't like you were asking at like an inopportune time. You were asking when everybody else was, you know, right. four months ago was the beginning of this. That's when people start planting their gardens. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that, I'm sorry you're having that struggle. Uh, it's, uh, how's your, did you get your uh, cover on your greenhouse? You got the, got no, not yet. No. no, it's been too hot. Yeah, that's, I hear you. As somebody's over here uh, suggesting, can she grow in bucket? Well, gophers go through a bucket. You're dealing no, with I that. Grow, I grow in pots all over the place too. No, they won't grow. They won't go through the bucket. No. Uh, and how how do the how do the plants do above ground in a hot pot? Like, what are you able to grow in in pots and that's that type of I've situation? I've grown tomatoes, eggplant. I've grown squash. I've grown just about any vegetable you can think of in a pot. Really. Okay, good. Good. Uh, so I I have that trouble here. Is that it just gets too hot in the well above ground. Um, you know, all the old big huge I call them fifteen gallons pots, but they're probably more than that. Um they're all black. They used to just make black. So I try to take an old soil bag that's white on one side and try to cover that black up because it dries the shit out of the soil really fast. But I, I know in the past, many years ago, I used to grow all my cherry tomatoes in them because they take up a lot of room. And I just grow them on the side of my house where they get the south south sun in the daytime. And they would grow up the side of the wall to the point where I'd have to tie them up against the wall just to keep them so I could walk past them. And they were in those black pots. But then I have some marjoram that grows. Now, the gophers leave the marjoram alone. Because it grows just fine in the ground, all in front of those pots. It ended up growing in front of it and kind of shading those pots just on its own. Plus, the bees love it to death. So, that one I never have trouble with gophers on. And rosemary and, well, yeah, rosemary and lavender. I've never had them eat the roots of those yet. Yeah, yeah. it seems like they're getting less picky as the years go on. It's a, more of a survival thing. Yeah. Well, I had this beautiful, it was called a curry plant. It's gray green leaves, you know, spiky leaves, and it'd get yellow, pretty pretty, pale yellow flat head of flowers. And I had it in the same spot for probably almost 30, 28, 30 years. And it just started declining every year. I would cut it back. And finally, it declined to a point where there was like one little stalk of the whole little bush that was green and the rest was all dead so okay i just figure i'm just gonna take it out and dig down in there the root was this big around but it had been gnawed through by a gopher <laughs> well I, I was really jealous of your big rosemary bush that you had when you're showing mm -hmm. that off in your garden it's like i'm i've been trying to select a rosemary here from seed for several years now and i've got some i got some really tough ones out there now and we're gonna see how they do this winter they're in the ground out in the garden and i'm i'm they hoping that i at least get one. Oh no no, no that uh, rosemary doesn't it doesn't like the winters here it really it it can't take it really i'm, I'm yeah i've had I've, mine buried in heavy snow maybe i should send you a you know it it does really good from hardwood cuttings too i should have scholar do a clone of it and send you one that, I'd appreciate it because I, I there's a, I've even bought cuttings of so-called hardy varieties. There's mm -hmm. several, there's two different types. One of them is called ARP and I don't think that I ever got a real one, but I may have, it just wasn't as, as hardy as they claim that it is, but there, there is hardy rosemary out there that can like what you're describing can really yeah. take some, some snow well, and my, cold feet. And my creeping rosemary is, which, you know, is, the hardier of the two, they would be normally, just because the stems seem to be a little bit more woody. But it's been in the same spot since I can for, forever. And it's got a rock wall in front of it on one side. And it gets snowed on, it gets baked in the heat, and it's still alive. It's been growing that long. I mean, that some of the stalks on uh, 
based on those are like that. Oh, awesome. That's a tree. Well, I don't know what, <laughs> what varieties they're selling there that can't handle the snow. That's interesting. Yeah. Up, and down the, going back. up and down the Sierras up here, people grow rosemary higher up than me. <laughs> Fascinating. That's interesting. Uh, I'm about to lose my culinary sage, I think, from all of this rain. Oh, I think I lost you also, Lisa. Can you hear me? From Cal. Uh, you're you're cutting in and out. So, oh, I got it back. on the Ethernet cable. I shouldn't be. Uh, it, it may be on my end because I'm I'm going to steal that idea. I think I think that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that. But uh, what I was uh, talking about is my uh, culinary sage. Since we're talking about uh, evergreen mm -hmm. uh, herbs, is my culinary sage didn't like all of this rain that we got. So I have some botrytis like starting right in the center of the plant and on the stems too. So I I don't think that it's salvageable. I don't wow. even think I'm going to take cuttings off of it. I'm just going to have to buy another one that's clean. But yeah, that botrytis really. Really did a number on it. And, uh, I cut everything away that I could, but like I said, it's on the stems at the base. So it's a, I think that it's curtains on that, which is sad. I'll, I'll get what good leaves I can off of it this year and yeah, yeah. Dry, dry them. But I, I'm sad about that because I, I love sage. I eat a lot of meat, so sage is an important thing in the kitchen in my house. Well, I have – that's interesting. You can start that pretty easy from seed, you know. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've, that's all all the ones that i've grown i've started from seed over the years i have one that's out there it's not looking real good right now because we didn't have a usually i don't cut it back till after all the cold weather's done to protect the crown of the plant and then in the late spring i'll cut back all the stuff and then it gets all the new growth well we didn't have that timing this year in our seasons so it didn't get that cold enough for me to i should say it didn't stay cold long enough like it's used to. So it's looking a little shabby right now, but I'm sure it'll come back in the spring. Right now it looks like a half the size of what it usually is. But it did bloom, and I don't know why. Yeah, wet feet might be a problem. Maybe planting on a mound, you know, raised up a little bit. Yeah, since I had this problem, that's what I'm going to do in the future for sure. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. As, and get uh, you some maybe in the bottom of your hole some you know how you have the the stuff on top for the worms something as simple as that in the bottom of the hole is going to give you that extra drainage raisin that roots up a little bit from sitting in a puddle maybe yeah that's a, what i like so much about this particular cutting is that it doesn't flower and i okay. i don't grow sage for flowers i grow it so that i can use it and what i once a sage plant, I've found, uh, I'm pretty into flavors, and I've found that the flavor on a sage plant, like, completely changes once it flowers once. Like, it, really? yeah, the, the, it, if, if you, which most do, they will flower at the end of the season, and essentially, like, if you let them come back the next year, they will come back, but they're going to be really ugly and woody and, like, not and they're going to taste bad. They're not going to taste like that original baby that you had uh, that yeah. had never flowered. And uh, I've never experienced that with any other herb except for sage. Sage, uh, like uh, my basil out there, it's got flowers all over it and it still tastes wonderful. It, right. Uh, it's well, not a problem that's at interesting. all. I've never noticed a difference in the flavor. I mean, since it's flowered numerous times over the years, I never noticed a difference in the flavor, but that's i'd have to try to pay attention to that better i'm told that i I'm, wouldn't uh, i will obviously i wouldn't harvest any leaves really when it's flowering but that time it would taste different i'm sure because it's putting all that energy into the flowers but i leave the flowers we get this we get the flowers in the early, early summer late spring usually so it sounds like your flowers at the end of the year that's interesting. Yeah. And this one, what I like so much about this culinary sage from Bonnie is it didn't flower at all last year, like not one flower bud. And that's what they selected it for is a sage that never went into flower. I'm, I'm sure that it could eventually, but yeah. it didn't. <laughs> I was very and now it broke, it's croaking. Yeah. Now it's it, it, just same thing. I have a really uh, awesome Rosa Sharon out there that was rotting from the inside at the base. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
it's dead. I'm, there's no saving it. And that, my wife's really upset because she started that thing from seed. She started several ones, but that was the pretty was prettiest one. Right. Really pink, uh, double flower, really pretty, like fuchsia pink. And she she really loved that. She named it Sharon. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> it had a name. Pardon me, Sharon, because it was like in a walkway. So it always like rubbed up against you when you yep. walk by it. And so it. Anyway, that's a, that's the way with plants, you know. It's you have them until you don't. Yeah. As cannabis people understand that a little more than others because there's we've had uh, more threats than just normal gardening. You could lose your plants for other reasons and your freedom, obviously. But anyway, won't 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 turn into a Debbie Downer. You want to see some of my beautiful tomatoes? Sure. All right, let me go grab them. Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> Almost just dumped them all in my lap or on the floor with that cord underneath of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, I'll show you some of these these phenotypes here. Is uh, I took a picture of a red one of these. Yeah. This this one is purple. I have both a red and a purple of these really wrinkly things. Wow. And this has the structure of like a uh, bell pepper. It, it's hollow inside. It's like a San Marzano. There uh -huh. is there is an heirloom out there. It's called a San Genovese, or it's a, some Italian yeah. name. Yeah. And but uh, or Costa Luvo or yeah yeah there that's yeah that sounds more familiar. But these are uh, phenotypes from my cross, and I got some of these wrinkly ones. As here's a red one that's a uh, a little bit more symmetrical. Yeah, that's a trip. Yeah. And same thing is they're uh, they're hollow on the inside, but they're really meaty. Is really good juice to me. It's not all water, you know. Like yeah. that's essentially what the goal here was. Here's a uh, well, it's got some leaves still stuck to it. I haven't washed these yet. Uh, here's another. This is a uh, another purple one. It's this is different than the uh, than that these are guy. Different plants, obviously. Oh yeah, these are all different different plants, and I kept all of the seeds separate. It's like the the phenotypes that had the flavor on them, and mm -hmm. were the ones and and that were uh, saucy, are the ones that I I moved on into the F three. So this one, I like this the purple. That's oh, cool. it's delicious. Like this is what I'm going for. This these things right here taste the most like the uh, pink Berkeley, and mm -hmm. they are they're a sauce tomato. And this That's one cool. in particular doesn't have the blossom end rot like the stripy ones. Like I, right. most of the stripy ones we picked today were uh, rotting, so they're out. They're still laying on the ground out there in the garden. And the ones that I uh, that were good were eaten this morning, so I don't have mm -hmm. any of those to show you. And so uh, a few of these were eaten also. They're, yeah. Uh, it, this is this is this was the goal of that project is this little guy. So I, oh good. I, I, this is probably the only one that I'm going to move forward with. Uh, I, and I want to ask you about these. This is a, a really good heirloom right here. Or Well, it's, these are F1s. But uh, the Juliet. Have you ever grown the Juliets? Uh -uh. Uh, of all the uh, hybrid tomatoes that I've ever grown, the Juliet is it. This makes really good sauce. It's it's pretty good saucy tomato. They mm -hmm. they're a little juicy, but uh, the flavor on these things is what what's the most amazing about them, and the flaw. And I say every year that I'm going to put a net. I'm going to put netting like some bird netting under the plants, is because as yeah. soon as these things are ripe, they let you know by falling to the earth. Oh really? And, yeah, it's a, and they do it when they're like kind of orangey. They're not not quite ripe, but they start falling all over the place. And it's that they've done it every wow. year. It, but the uh, they're worth growing because of the flavor in them. It's a, they're do the they birds have, get at the ones that fall? No, no, That's good. no. They just rot. 
and if you don't get them off the ground obviously yeah yeah <laughs> this one <laughs> this one right here that's not going to show up on my shitty camera but these things are like green and red stripe they're called uh, bronze torch and uh this was given to me i got, got a handful of these last year from a farmer mm -hmm. and uh he's been working on it for several generations it was uh originally an f1 he bought it from a johnny's and uh he select he kept seeds from that and he kept the ones that were that came out true to the original thing that he had bought from johnny's and uh the only difference is he said that they got mm -hmm. smaller the one that he ended up keeping moving forward this is like four or five years in generations that he selected this thing until last year when he handed them to me and uh mm -hmm. he went through and uh kept selecting for these and they ended up smaller but with better flavor which you I have, I've, you've probably noticed this too, that smaller fruits often are more flavorful fruits, not a steadfast more rule. Concentrated, yes. Yeah. So these are beautiful. Yeah, the they really impress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing's absolute, you know, As, but those you are really cool. You ever get a hold of a black cherry? That's a good flavor too. I have a chocolate cherry and they're really deep purple. They're, yeah, that's one of my wife's favorites because of the sweetness in them. They're, they're a really sweet tomato. Yeah, I so think the black I've never had black cherries. Acid. It's a little more acidic, sweet. I like the more as higher acid tomatoes personally. Yeah, but same here. They're hard to find now. Have you found that that the more acidic ones are harder to get a hold of? Like that old flavor. I remember going to my uncle's farm when I was a kid and eating this like cracked up tomato is like it didn't look great no, but i'll really. never forget that flavor yeah I, and i can't find it the closest thing is the sioux it was done by the university of nebraska sioux tomato is the most acidic tomato that i find and it still wasn't enough acid for me <laughs> <laughs> still didn't it didn't taste like uncle randall's that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's a bummer when you can't find that flavor again that you remember so well because so much of our memory can be activated by things like that smells and tastes and happens all the time to me take me back somewhere in the past to some fond memory of eating that flavor and tomatoes especially i can think of the the brandy i know <clears throat> And it's probably a brandywine beefsteak type tomato that my aunt was serving me. But that had some pretty good acid when I was a kid. I don't remember having low acid tomatoes <laughs> when I was a kid. But, you know, yeah. I didn't know the difference, obviously. But, I mean, I've grown a, to a yellow tomato that's kind of on the low acid side. I grew that one year for a friend of mine just because she liked low acid tomatoes. And it was pretty good, but you missed that bite from the acidity. And, you know, the problem with the lower acid tomatoes is the whole idea of boiling water bath is a high acid vegetable, a tomato. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to add anything to it in order to just use the boiling water bath instead of the pressure canner. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're using low acid tomatoes, if you're not getting that acid percentage up enough. It might be unsafe to cook it in the boiling water bath canner. Yeah, it's the, the tomatoes now, everybody, they're so low acid that you, you got to add lemon juice to your canning recipe. And you like you're saying, that shouldn't be, my grandma didn't do that. No, <laughs> I, I do it. I add lemon juice to mine just be, just to be safe. Yeah. You know, like it, some aromas, I don't tend, tend to get as much acid flavor, but that's just, I usually can them and I don't eat that many that way. I don't usually eat that many of them. Um without cooking them up first yeah the aromas i had some gold san marzanos many years ago and i think i saved some seeds from my just haven't found them um but they were huge i made gold tomato sauce it was totally cool uh, yeah i can't find them anymore though yeah i've never seen i've never seen that in the catalog that sounds amazing as, it must I, have I been like territorial, I, I would guess, from how long ago it was, because where I was buying seed from at the time was, I didn't know about Baker's Creek yet. All right. I have a little yellow, uh, it, it started off as a yellow pear, and it's a, it's been, again, that's, I, I know farmers around here, so, and they... Hey. 
they 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 share my interest in some of these things so they they saw my cool tomatoes over the years and they they like to share theirs so i uh this guy handed me some a packet of seeds and it's it was off these tomatoes from his farm that he i, I don't know why he went to the trouble of doing this but he he could have just given me some tomatoes like the guy last year did but he handed me some seeds and uh he told me that these uh, that he planted these things like 15 20 years before and he just let them go wild in this this place and they yeah. went from pear shapes into this nice big fat juicy oval thing and really? it, oh yeah it's, it, it it selected itself and it has no disease pressure it doesn't crack is this thing selected itself on this guy's uh, cattle farm for years and he's still That's got them cool. out there it did its own open pollination. <laughs> yep, that's that's what happened. And uh, I've I've got a hold of those now, and I've spread those around. Uh, other people have. I gave some of the, those to Peter also. But you were talking about gold sauce. I made some gold salsa last year out of those things, and it was oh amazing. yeah, there you go, amazing. I, I loved it. I hope to do it again this year. A, I didn't plan as many of those this year because I was more focused on my my project. I wanted to right. get as many of the, the those separate phenotypes out there so I can get a look at uh, different plants because I wasn't expecting them to come true like they did. It's that right. it it really lined itself up, and I'm so happy that the flavor on that one is what I like. This this guy, yeah, that guy right and there. That's he may get bigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a, I'm not so. So worried about that as uh, so i don't care about the color or the size or the shape i'm after a certain yep exactly that on my uh basil project yeah the, the uh f2 no, was it no it was the f1 the original cross when i did the f1 of that a lot of them came out spotted i crossed a uh red reuben with the normal mm -hmm. sweet basil mm -hmm. and they came out like beautiful green with purple spots a lot of them it was it was the most pretty basil i've ever seen but it turned out that the ones with the spots on them like that, uh, they didn't have the flavor I was looking for. So I didn't move forward with those. So that's it, interesting. Yeah. So you sacrifice flavor for beauty. <laughs> yes. And I wasn't about to do that. So I, I, I went with the ones that and I was hoping that later in the generations that those spots would come back and have the flavor so that I could have both never seen a spotted one since that yeah. that first generation and I've, I've i've given a lot of those away too with the are they coming out green now or purple uh they have green uh leaves but the flowers are purple it looks oh, cool. like a it looks like an asian basil variety but it's not right. it, it, do, it doesn't taste anything like thai basil but it looks a lot like it oh okay but the leaves are fatter and it there's a lot of differences between mine and thai it, but oh, it's a uh, yeah pretty cool it's, and uh i and what I was selecting uh, for with that was to get away from that Thai flavor because Thai, the Thai basil is very licorice and yeah. I don't like licorice in my marinara. I don't know if anybody else does, but I don't. Yeah. So that's why I did that basil project so that I could have basil that I could plant from seed every year that doesn't make my marinara taste like licorice. <laughs> and I wouldn't be worked. using Thai basil and marinara anyway. No, 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 no. But uh, sweet basil. The reason I did it is because sweet basil basil has a lot of licorice uh, that pops yeah, out of some of the plants. And I didn't like going through and like having to find the licorice ones early on and cull them out and leave the the ones that didn't. So I decided to do a breeding project so I wouldn't have to do that the rest of my life. Yeah, basil I, cross pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot easier than the tomatoes. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they, it just, they, I just let two plants grow next to each other for the basil. Worked out beautifully. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Yeah, that. that's why I had to do. <laughs> let the All bees right. do the rest. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. I, I, I'm glad we think about things in the same way of, of, of where that goes. I got, I got something else to show off here too. Is uh, I've noticed that I'm glad you knew what that uh, ochre flower was. That was very, especially being out in Cali, is uh, okra gets a lot of hate. And I don't think that, the re I think the reason that it gets so much hate is because a lot of people don't experience what I'm holding right here. Oh, baby the, one. The, the little ones, they're not as slimy as the, they're, <laughs> they're juicy, but they don't have that slime that everybody hates and they're not woody. And these actually taste really good. They have kind of a floral sweet kind of deal with them at all they're oh, cool. really delicious I like the young ones yeah and it, unless you're a uh 
a farmer, unless you're a gardener and you grow it yourself, you're not going to be, you can't go to the store and buy that. I've never seen ochre that size unless it's been canned. Right. You can get it in the pickle aisle, but you, you're not going to be able to buy it and uh, eat it fresh and experience the flavor. It, you obviously know what I'm talking about here. You may not like it, but I like good. it. I've been uh, I've been eating okra since I was a kid. I'm from Kansas. <laughs> okay, yeah. I like the slimy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. It's a really good thir- thirst quencher. Like I, I don't mind eating a big one that's a little woody on a hot day because i don't have to go in and get something to drink (laughs) (laughs) i can um find those small ones at a farmer's market if i get there before anyone else oh that's awesome so there's people out there that know what's up yeah Uh, they're not all okra haters that's good no but (laughs) for the most part you say okra and they just go ew yeah like well you know you don't it's it's a real good thickener in soup, I'll tell you what. That's why gumbo gets so thick. Yeah. That's why I'm in the okra. Mm, love Maybe they gumbo. came up with gumbo to use all the bigger pods. <laughs> good good theory. Is that there's like the there's only a the, you can only let go okra get so big before it turns into this woody, horrible thing like that mm-hmm. I don't even want around, you know. It's, unless I'm making seeds. Right. I, I really don't like letting it get that big because then right. it becomes nothing that's useful. So yeah, you can't eat that. No, no. And, and the chickens won't even touch it. Like, it is interesting. I throw that out there to the chickens, and no, nah, we don't want those. Not even the seeds, because the seeds <laughs> even get like uh, hard right. to explain. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's, it, it that that was really cool to me that you you knew what that was immediately and said it got a lot of uh, comments afterward or a few comments afterwards about people. It's like, I, I never knew ochre was so beautiful. It makes it actually useful or something like that. <laughs> it's, it's a member of the hibiscus family. Actually. Oh, that makes sense. It looks a lot like it. That's, yeah. That's uh, why the flowers are so pretty. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been fascinated with the consistencies within families of plants, like a lot of the brassicas, the seeds look the same on those. And obviously yeah. tomato seeds all look the same as uh, peppers are pretty universal. But uh, my buddy sent me a black pepper. Have you ever seen a, a, a black pepper seed before? It's only coming out of a pepper that's been on a um, pepper too long or on the plant for a long time. Yeah, uh, well, uh, these, uh, let me go grab those. All of them were black, yeah. yeah, yeah, this, and it's, I looked into it. I, I thought that he had threw, gave, given me something else. I thought it was another seed. Like, he sent me a bunch of peppers, and that's all it was. Well, mm-hmm. there's there's a few cannabis seeds, too. But the, uh, I know what those look like. But the, <laughs> there was this one package that had black seeds in it. They looked like peppers, but they were black. And I was like, this is. And I know he's not sending me rotten seeds. <laughs> this guy, he's he's too on point to be sending me some rotten seeds. So let me go grab these things. And because uh, I don't really, all of these names are like crazy, like South American names and stuff on them. Right. And that's what this is. This is a uh, a South American heirloom. And it's known for these black seeds and uh, hard to grow. This thing's really hard to grow. <laughs> it's a challenge. Chris and I were showing each other our uh, pepper seeds the other day, and I somehow missed this package because because I haven't put it in back in the fridge yet. But I saw it, and I'm glad that I did before this thing with you. It's called the Small Orange Rocoto, the hog leg selection. Hog legs, my boy. And uh, he selected these in 2017. And let's see here. Look at oh, those little wow. guys. Those are black pepper seeds that aren't rotten. Wow. That's and, a trip. Uh, I've never seen that. No, nope. yeah, never heard of I, that one either. Yeah, I, I looked into it, and uh, it, I think it's from Peru. I don't remember the exact place, but it was deep, deep South America. Right. And uh, yeah, the orange ricotto. It's like it's known out there, and it's it has a it has a bit of a rep for uh, being hard to germinate. So that's why I didn't plant these this year. He sent me a bunch of stuff, and I wanted to really get a, a look at a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the stuff that he sent me and I didn't, I, 
I've been uh, preoccupied to say the least this gardening season. So I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to give these uh, Rakotos the the attention yeah, that they were going to require. So yeah. next year, hopefully, when I'm a little less distracted by bullshit. Do you uh, germinate them in in the ground or in pots or? Uh, I started. I start everything inside in a uh, okay. in. My uh, aunts taught me to germinate in uh, ice trays. I germinate That's everything. Not, I can in, see that. Yeah, I just drill a little hole in each little ice tray compartment, and I, I start everything on heat mats and lights inside. And oh, then good. I move. Yeah, your move heat mats will help you with the pepper. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. So, oh, somebody's saying that the Rokoto is a group of varieties. There's a certain. I don't know if they all got pepper black seeds or not, but that's interesting. I'll look uh, into that one. I'm, we have a pepper problem in as far as buying pepper seeds in this family. <laughs> we like doing <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, apparently, one New Year's Eve, my, my son and I spent one New Year's through the We had just gotten to Baker Street, the big, thick catalog that you paid 12 bucks for. Yeah. Have you ever bought, have you ever bought that one? It's almost I a know copy of the book. I've looked at it at the bookstore. Uh, I got my ideas. I went through. I went to the bookstore and did it the cheap way, and just sat there for hours and went through it and enjoyed myself and saved the twelve bucks. And then I got online and ordered what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can just do that too. But yeah, it just reminded me of being a kid with the Sears Wish Book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot like that. That's a, that's why I made that trip. I went to the bookstore to just kind of hang that up, but. Yeah, maybe I should buy one and support him a little more because I that I like what that guy does. Have you ever been to the store in Petaluma? No. You haven't? I have not been to the store in Petaluma. All right. As everybody when expo. I ask that. What's that? They have an expo out here every September. And uh heirloom they call it the heirloom expo. And it's always in September and I'm always not able to go. <laughs> and they have all kinds of speakers. It's like a four-day event, I think. And you've got heirloom farmers that bring all their stuff from all over the state. It's totally cool. I've always wanted to go, but never been able to go. Yeah. Stuff like that in California, it really makes me want to want to be there. It's the, I, I would be around more like-minded individuals if I was out there. There's other states, too, but Cali is very ag. There's a lot yeah. of agriculture out there. Yeah. It's really cool. cool. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I don't know how well every, we're doing with this drought because everybody's feeling it at this point. You know, uh, uh, the southern states, Arizona and top, upper part of Mexico is going to start feeling it pretty soon because the water that feeds into the Hoover Dam, it's too low to go through. the. It's getting almost, they call it Deadpool. It's almost getting to Deadpool, which means that the hydroelectric, system at the dam will shut down and they won't be able to bring it back up if the water ever comes back up but i don't know if you've ever seen pictures of hoover dam and lake mead is huge normally when it's not a drought now it's down to a point where it's below that turbine thing and it's going to reach that at any time and that supplies water to lots like southern nevada and arizona and i think down into mexico in Southern California. So. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, I see all of like the, the trickle down implications of something like that. And yeah. it, it, that's going to get really nasty really quick. Oh Humans. yeah. Well, this stupid <laughs> County, they don't even own their water rights to our water because some fool back in the 1800s, some, you know, some fool signed over his claim to the water and it's never been in this county we're trying to get it back from pg and e our electric company owns one of the reservoirs up here and they give us an allotment of water out of it but it's pretty ridiculous they're trying to buy it out back from pg and e but i'm thinking they don't want to let go of it quite yet because we have this antique flu system that goes through the mountains that brings our water to our county and it's all wood and it's up on the sides of hills and highly inaccessible in places. So if something falls on on the flu and breaks that, 
that interrupts the water supply. Knock on wood, we haven't had that happen. Or if a fire comes and takes that out, we're going to be in big trouble. Hmm. Well, yes, it, uh, it sounds like every location has its challenges. Like, oh, so absolutely. It's not specific to that, but as it, you got no. something similar, but different. <laughs> oh, well. well and I, yeah. It's poor just, planning and decisions like what you were talking about, like not not having foresight into the future seems to be a big problem with uh, political folks and developers. Right. And. Oh, we lost her. See, I had to do it. I had to do it. It's a, I'm sorry. That's my fault. Oh, she's okay. back. <laughs> OK, <laughs> what would you say? I'm sorry. Oh, I was talking about how no, I forgot now. Oh, you know, the implications of it, 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 they don't care about, they not only don't care, look, have the foresight for the future, but I think they just don't care. It's an immediate, I'm worried about me. You know, that's the problem with the world today. It's all about me, me, me. I got mine. I don't care if you got yours, you know, and that's why the cannabis community is so great. Um, fcp i think that everybody tries to help each other out you know whether it's just advice or anything else so it sucks when you get you know people that come on and do otherwise you know yep uh, there's always one in every crowd or sometimes more <laughs> yeah <you know? laughs> yeah yeah so uh, we kind of have that community you know, from people like minded people that grow not just you know vegetables or cannabis they just a lot of ornamental flower growers up here and herbs and it just you know that was what i was so baffled by is that here i'm trying to give uh, royal gold a new connection to a possible new customer base you think they'd be trying to get it just a little bit quicker then yeah, oh well i have a lot of patience <laughs> <laughs> hey that's a gardening thing for sure, as if you, sure. If you can't be impatient and try to grow plants, like that's that's why a lot of cannabis growers fail is that they yeah. don't, and and uh, even people that uh, know better, like it, I, I'm going to harp about the jumping worms a little bit here because the the living soil people have a lot to do with those jumping worms being out there with you guys now and destroying your forest. Oh, have you really? heard of, about these jumping worms, the Asian jumping worms? I kind of heard a little bit. Yeah, I, I imagine they're. Yeah, I imagine they're going to try to keep that under wraps as best as possible because that's just one more thing that you all are under attack by out there. But, I think the un university setting something out. They're pretty good at notifying people about. At least they notify the master gardener community in hopes that we pass it along to, the people that we talk to, so that they're aware of. Like we have the Asian psyllid fly. It's ruining a lot of the citrus crops in Southern California. So they have monitoring stations and they'll quarantine a whole neighborhood if they find a fruit tree that has those on it. And so they're pretty good about get, keeping up on that stuff. So um, I just haven't been paying that much attention, to be honest. I, I did read something a little bit, but I'm sure if I were to look into the university stuff, I'd find out a little bit more. Yeah, we get all amazing. kinds of crap brought here from places, <laughs> which yeah. is amazing because, you know, they actually do have ag inspectors, but I guess they're going to have to start having soil inspectors. More yeah. soil inspectors. And it's going to be hard when you got people like shipping worms through the mail and stuff like that, too. It's like uh, to give you a brief rundown of what happened here mm -hmm. is that uh, out here in the east and in the south, they've had. These things have been around for a long time, decades. Right. They're around forever. Uh, they came with what uh, did they do? Japanese. They're uh, they're mistakenly called composting worms, but they are not composting worms. They they do break down material really fast, but they also like uh, consume all the good stuff and use that to breed and multiply and make more oh, bad worms. Great. So they're, they're, these are not reg wigglers. These things are, they just turn, they, they do break things down fast. And that's why the living soil people 
thought that they, they would be a good idea to enter this into their system to like kind of cut some time off, you know, mm-hmm. it's a, but it, it's turned into a, a natural disaster. And I think you were there the other day when I was getting on the hippies and, and all of that is that it wasn't really the hippies. It was just the, the, the living soil people that didn't do enough research, which seems to be a common problem not just yeah. with them, but just people in general is not looking into it. Like we were talking about a few minutes ago, foresight and looking right. into the future a little bit, but they thought that they were uh, going to be able to break down their organic material faster using these worms. But if they had looked into these worms a little deeper, they would have known that they weren't going to get anything usable out of it. It may have break it down faster, but they say that it, it breaks, they turn, uh, instead of turning it into topsoil, they turn mm-hmm. it into this little, really gritty, like, uh, some it's uh, they call it coffee grounds because that's what it resembles and uh and there's no nutritional value to it no it and it's killing the the the, the forest can't regenerate itself so no that's seedlings sad. will grow in this it's 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 a real real bad thing that's going on out there and it's uh, uh maybe california can put an end to it but you uh what kept them in check down here the reason that we still have forests is because the weather like the colder winters and all of that. Yeah, there's essentially like kind of kept their populations in check to where they didn't destroy the land. But out in California, it's a completely different environment as like that's what we're here talking right. about today is I'm learning more about your environment. And uh, yeah, the worms really love it because you all are closer to Asia. Like uh, right. the, 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 you're more compatible with the environment that they came from. Oh, great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, enjoy your redwoods while you have them. Yeah, <laughs> as if as if global warming wasn't enough, we'll just give some jumping worms to the forest. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly. really terrible. <laughs> I wonder if they came over here originally just in some plants or something. They, or yeah, they shipped them over here. That I've heard two different stories, and what makes the most sense to me is that they came over in ornamentals, like the Japanese beetle did. Like the Japanese right. came over, the Japanese beetle came over here in an iris soil. Right. So uh, I imagine I don't know for sure because there's a debate on it, but some say that it was the uh, the Japanese farmers moved to the south and they brought them with them. And then I, I ask they would know better why would they bring this with them on purpose like it makes more sense that they accidentally brought some soil that had some like they brought some tubers or something with them right there was eggs in the soil and they weren't aware of it because they that's another thing is their eggs are smaller than uh the worms that we're used to you can see with if you have good eyes you can see a uh red wiggler egg yeah the little egg case with your naked eye and these are smaller and harder to detect so there's All there's around. your there's another problem that you have. <laughs> What's that? No, I don't have that particular problem at the moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep an eye on information on that though, because yeah, we don't need any help having another problem out here. <laughs> you know, we have the like we have the broom plant, like yellow flowering plant broom, Scottish Scottish broom. Well, that came over here as packing material for people's stuff on ships. Hmm. And it's, it's, they've been fighting it for years in the Santa Cruz mountains and we've got it up here and they're trying to fight it too. Cause it, what it does is it, you know, it shades out all the native plants and it, and it, and it ruins the native plant community in the area and it just takes over. It's another invasive uh, non-native plant that we have to deal with in California. I don't know how it is in other parts. I mean, there's some plants that grow, I guess, down where you're at that they don't want to plant them because they become invasive. Where out here, they just stay nice and manageable. And I don't know what that is. You probably got pretty good dirt back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, we got plenty of good soil, that's for sure. Uh, and we, we have our fair share of invasive things. Like the, the biggest problem around here would be the, uh, the kudzu. Like kudzu kills trees, it, right. it just blocks it. It eats up all of the light and won't let a tree photosynthesize, and that's a that's a big issue around here. But a lot of people are into that and eradicating that from their land. So, right, we uh, have we, star thistle, which is lovely. 
And right now, if you see a hillside that looks like it's kind of gray green while the rest of the hills around it are all brown right now, it's just total star thistle. And the stuff, if the cows eat it or the horses eat it, it's poisonous to them. And it'll take over whole properties if it, if it's not kept under check. And it's not until about maybe eight years ago that they came up with a, an actual star thistle killer because it's really hard to kill. And if you, you know, a lot of people will weed whack it, which seems sends the seeds flying. And if it gets stuck on somebody's car driving and falls off somewhere down, you know, 10, 20 miles away, it starts growing down there. <laughs> wow. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, she froze up on me again. I don't know about you guys. Oh, That's she's right. back. <laughs> We're back. Anyway, if you cut it off at the ground and don't leave any grow, uh, foliage or anything, it, it won't regenerate from the root. But a lot of people don't realize that. So they, if you weed whack it and you don't get all the all the foliage off, then it'll just grow right back. And you can't burn it because the time of year it needs to be burned is right now, which there is no burning being allowed in California legally unless it's a controlled burn done by the Forest Service. So... You can't burn the shit because it's the wrong time of year to burn it. And I know one guy, I think he took his tractor. He said he made a big old huge, you know, who knows how many feet long pile of it and just let it sit there and composted. It got it really hot and broke down the seed. But the thing is, the seed can stay viable in the soil for at least seven years. Hmm. Seven years. We got some plants. Out here, seeds can be viable for 20 years in the dirt. I mean, you might not have ever had it somewhere, this particular plant where you're living. And all of a sudden, this plant shows up and you have no idea. You disturb the soil or something, change something in your yard. And this perfect condition set up for this to germinate again. And all of a sudden, you got this new plant that you don't know where it came from. <laughs> oh. wow. Probably like the nightshade. Uh, we have a lot of the nightshade. Jimson weed or Daytura plants. You know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about? You probably yeah, we have, have those. Some form yep. of that back there. Yep. They're so beautiful, though, that I let them grow in my yard, even though they're poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> but they yeah. have those giant trumpet flowers, and the bumblebees just go nuts in those. <laughs> uh, that's it. it is a really beautiful plant. It, you, uh, and it's... Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Jimson weed. I know I know a lot about Jimson weed because uh, the horse industry. It's used yeah. in horse racing. It's uh, it's used as a painkiller for the horses. This is how they've uh, the belladonna in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is this has gone back for quite a while. Uh, uh, know. You know, have you heard of Secretariat? Yeah. The horse Secretariat, very That's famous right. horse. Secretariat was a cokehead. Like yeah. they, before they were uh, testing for all of that, uh, to think about the time when secretary is like the mid to late seventies when he yeah. was, he was doing his thing. And uh, if you look at uh secretary, once he was stud out, studded out, you see like a human going through Coke withdrawals and he, and he was given so much of this stuff that his Coke withdrawals went on until the day he died. Like he, he was a very calm horse when he had that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like he, he, it was basically given to him for, to run. And he was, they, they had him on a schedule, obviously, because that's how it's done. And, uh, but after, after he was done racing and studded out, they didn't have a reason and it obviously expensive, yeah. <laughs> but they, when he was racing, they were getting a return on their investment, if you know what I mean. So, but it, yeah, if you look at some, uh, look up some old videos, I encourage people to do this because it, 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 to me, it's animal abuse is they should oh, have yeah. given him the Coke afterwards too. If you're going to fucking do that to him, don't let him go through Coke withdrawals for five or six years after he, I imagine he didn't live a very long life because no. of all of the stress afterwards. No, I don't think his heart probably freaking gave out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's, the, that's but, really sad. No. I didn't realize that because I, you're right. I don't remember them ever talking about doing testing back then on horses. You know, you nope. heard of athletes getting tested, but they never were testing 
the horses at race time or anything. Yep. Not like they do now. And then they switched to Jimson weed for a while, and Bob Baffert got caught for Jimson weed, and that, that kind of put a squash on all of that. And Bob Baffert's been a very, like, anybody that follows horse racing, he's in trouble now. Like, he's banned, and he, he can't go to horse races in some places because uh, uh, his last scheme was a uh, topical thing is they were rubbing this pain reliever on the skin in high amounts and it, it came through in a test and i guess he wasn't expecting that going through the skin like that yeah. but uh, so yeah he, he he's not the only one he's just the one that's been sloppy enough to get caught several times and they, <laughs> they really cracked down on him but it all started with secretary and the coke Wow. That kind of <laughs> destroys the old dream of watching him when I was young and, and rooting for him to win. And Oh, he's high on coke. Okay, nobody bothers to mention that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Looking well, back that makes on you it. wonder, was he really that fast? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so did he pass anything good on in his studying, studying him out? I mean, exactly. A lot of people got ripped off on that sperm. I'm no thinking, doubt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that that's how I found out about it is uh, I, I know in, uh, being in the automotive industry and uh, my dad doing uh, custom vehicles and paint jobs for people, we, we've dealt with a lot of very rich people with money to blow, like somebody right. that's just going to spend 20 grand with me and my dad to build some rebuild some old piece of junk that they drive that they right. don't usually don't drive it's a it's a trailer queen that they're pulling in and off <laughs> of a trailer a few times a year just to impress their friends but you get to you get to know a lot of different type of people with that right. and there was one horse guy and he's the one that taught me all of this about secretariat and what what was going on in the horse industry and everything and it's like uh and i i obviously didn't take it at face value and i started to look look at what he was talking about and it's like and you can see it you just look at those videos of secretary at racing and then there's plenty of videos of him after he studded out and like it, the video doesn't lie it yeah. matches up with the story and what's happened since then with the jimson weed and then now whatever that stuff that baffert was caught with right. that, that was a chemical that uh, he wasn't he had to get out of the natural realm apparently so yeah anyway so I, i'm going ranting about some other subjects so i guess it's oh, about it's time fine. to end this thing <laughs> uh hour and a half uh are you doing anything cool today what, what you what you got planned oh well uh, skylar was helping skylar transplant my guerrero blasters <laughs> no <clears throat> into bigger pots no probably not much till this evening when it cools off a teeny bit it was still like i went to bed at mm, 11 and it was still 80 degrees outside <laughs> so therefore sleeping wasn't real fun between the pain and the heat and yeah i don't know what was going on with me yesterday though my head i mean besides my back locking up really bad you know and it doesn't take me doing anything anymore i could you know i'll Usually for me, something will show up three days after I've done something that I shouldn't probably do. You know, like, you know, maybe moving some big old rock or something. Because even though I'm not, I shouldn't do those things. And I know inherently while I'm doing them, I'm hurt like hell when I get done. I still do it anyway. Because I just, that's all that I, who else is going to do it if I don't do it is the way I look at it. I'm that kind of person. I'm not going to wait around for somebody to volunteer <laughs> to get something done. It's that way in Master Gardener. So <laughs> yeah, you'll be I, waiting. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I I I don't think I did anything out of the ordinary that made it act up. It just decided to start jacked up, be jacked up. So that's okay. It's not okay, but it's something that I've had to live with for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully we'll get out there and uh we have so many projects start trying to get the shade cloth up that I was talking about. So we can go out there when it's like this and maybe not die. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish I was closer to you because I'd be there helping you. I I, I like you a lot and I I would love to be out as a, 
it sucks I'm on the other side of the country because I'd, oh, well, I'd have that shade cloth, cloth up already for you. No doubt about that. So that I, you would be able to work out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I appreciate the thought. No, yeah. that's not cool. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, best of luck with it. And I'm sorry that I kind of suggested another project to, to add to your list to get done. But Well, no, I need to get those worms out of that tub. And that's a perfect solution right there. I mean, there's enough worms in there at this point to do more than one worm bin, I swear. I haven't gone through and separated those worms. It's probably, I don't know, a foot deep in worm poop. Oh, yeah, they're not going to like that. That's why I left my uh, worm bin. It's why the rocks were still exposed, is I wanted some of that old stuff in the center to wash (laughs) out. So that they, when they dove in in the winter time, they weren't diving into pure castings because right. they don't want to live in pure castings. That's the reason why they push it in different directions. Right. That's why I need to get, like I said, if I take that bin and split it in half and just put it all in one of those things, that would be enough worms to get it started easily. Yeah. And a perfect starter, too. Like you really got that yeah. bacteria rich stuff in there. And, and right. yeah, that's a, I, I hope you can get it done. Is don't don't try to kill yourself on it, you know. But uh, just slowly move some rocks around or get some dirt moved out a little bit at a time to open one of your beds up. I hate to I hated to su- I almost didn't want to suggest that to you because I, I I can tell how proud you are of those. They're beautiful, like natural rock, and it's like it's absolutely beautiful. It's it, it has so much potential. But it, you can't we grow things out of We try to use what we have on hand. You know, we've been known to, well, we used to. You know, we'd be out in the forest getting firewood, and we'd get a load of rocks and then bury it under all the firewood. And bring. We have rocks from all over the place. We'll be camping at a beach or something and find this really cool big rock. And here's my husband putting it in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I can remember where a lot of them came from. You know, most of them from the yard, but I have some from here, there, and everywhere, and people's yards in the county, and that's available if you need it. You can get a permit and do it for free, but I never thought, I didn't know that back then when we were getting firewood on our own, that we could get a permit. We just figured, well, we're here. Look at this cool rock, and this one, and this one, and this one, and so, yeah, there's a couple of walls we've never been able to finish, but you know, time goes a lot faster when you get older. <laughs> huh. Uh, that's too bad it doesn't slow down to where you can enjoy it, you know? That's, right. Uh, uh, life. Well, it's it's been a lot of fun talking to you, Lisa. Uh, next time, uh, Peter suggested that the uh, next time that I talk to you... Uh, he, this was after the last show is uh, maybe you contact some of your people in your network, like uh, maybe a, a local farmer or a gardener. It doesn't matter if the doesn't have to be weed. It can be ornamental flowers, like you were saying mm-hmm. and stuff like that, but maybe bring one of your friends or colleagues on to talk about a subject that you want to want to discuss. And I would be ha- more than happy to facilitate that. Sure. Sure. All right. Let's see what I can do. All right. um, I can talk about anything else that you care to talk about also. But, um, yeah, I can right. also uh, bring up, um, I can, I have access to a lot of uh, the presenters that we've had in a lot of our classes, too, that, re- that we record them on Zoom that we've had. Because we had to do our whole program Zoom in 2020. We weren't able to have contact with the public. It really sucked, other than via the computer. Thank goodness, but we still have some of our open garden days. And, you know, I went and did videos of, like I did a video of our uh, rose person at our demo garden, a video of her pruning the roses. I did a video of the guy pruning the grapes. You know, I've got access to those kind of things, too, if we were ever wanting to look on those. You can actually find them on, if you look up UCTV on YouTube, you can find a lot of that stuff. Okay. UCTV. Plus, they have a wealth of other information on there. All right. So you gave me a little homework today, and I'm expecting that every time that I talk to you. So (laughs) you're a wealth of knowledge, Lisa. I appreciate you reaching out and coming on here with us. So I'm going to look into UCTV and Renee's Seed Company. 
So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. So, uh, again, really nice talking to you. I hope everybody has a great day and don't work too hard. Stay cool and hydrated. Peace, all right. Everyone. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bye now. Bye.